Thank you, everyone. This is quite intimidating <laughs> to see so many people. There are some empty seats up here if you guys want to come up. It's a friendly audience, though. Yeah. So I, I think you know, it would be helpful for me to know who has heard of Eileen Fisher. Yeah. OK, quite a lot. Um, is everyone here like CALS or Fiber Science? Uh, Dyson? Johnson? OK, no Johnson. Um, did I miss anyone? Is, there's ILR, maybe? Arts and Sciences? <laughs> All right, so um, the last time I was here, I was taking field crop system class from Professor Seder and Julie Lauren. So it's really strange to be on this side of the classroom. Um, so like uh, Terry said, I mean, Fisher is a women's clothing company. I'm going to pass this down. This is our latest okay. catalog. Um, it has some information on sustainability in there. And we started in, it was started by Eileen herself in 1984. So the same year Apple started, but we are still much smaller <laughs> compared to them. Um, we are a certified B corporation uh, and a benefit corporation in New York State, which means that we, we don't just drive towards financial profits, but we also try to take care of people and planet. Um, so I've been with Eileen Fisher for nine years, and part of the social consciousness team and my focus is the livelihood and the well-being of the supply chain workers. And a few years ago, I think it was like, it's more than five years ago, that I started getting really interested in bringing the work upstream. My work has primarily focused at the finished garment level. And I wanted to do something at the farm level eventually, but I know nothing about agriculture. So I decided to come, come to school and join the program. Um, it's something funny. At first, extension meant nothing to me. It just meant it's just a word that means extension. I didn't know it has a different meaning in agriculture. That's how little I know about agriculture. It was a steep learning curve last year at this time. And I think since the school is much more focused on the uh, food supply chain, I'm going to kind of walk people through on how a garment is made. So as you can see, it's a long and distant relationship between the brand and the raw material producer. So, and every garment is different. Every garment has its own supply chain. For a 100% silk garment, you know, it will be only silk at this end and a 100% silk garment at the end. But when you get to a sweater that's silk and cashmere, for example, then it's two supply chain coming from two farms. Or three supply chain if it has spandex and it's coming from an oil rig. you know. <laughs> so it is definitely um, difficult for a brand to manage all of this different supply chain. We don't purchase yarn or fiber. We purchase the finished garment. And this is a, just to give you a sense of where our suppliers are, this is a, the location of all of our uh, finished garment suppliers as well as the mill. So like in this picture, the mill, it refers to spinning, textile formation, dyeing. Um, so it, this map does not include the farm right now. You can actually find this as well as a list of all of our suppliers on the website at EileenFisher.com. And <clears throat> I want to show, you know, like my environmental counterpart, uh, like I focus on the human rights side of the supply chain. We have a person who focus on the environmental side, actually two people right now. And she always says that, I mean, Fisher is a land-based company. And you can see it from this chart, like man-made cellulosic, it's from forest. Uh, it's stretchy fabric that was converted from wood pulp, cotton, you know, bass fiber, mainly organic cotton, uh, linen, as well as wool. And silk is also an agricultural product. So that's like 89% um, just in this pie chart is um, the top five fiber is agricultural, as well as, you know, you can see that synthetics only constitute about 8%. So that's from metal and oil. Um, we have done some work at the agricultural level, and it's 
maybe a it's a, definitely a little more unusual, you know, compared to other fashion companies. We have done some work on cotton with the Organic Cotton Accelerator Program in India. Um, still working on it. It's been challenging. And we are sourcing some transitional cotton, uh, trans transitional organic cotton from New Mexico. Um, the farmer is trying to convert uh, the farm to organic. And we decided to help him by buying his transitional cotton for three years before he gets certified. In wool, we work with Textile Exchange and the Savory Institute on um, responsible wool, you know, st setting the standard, as well as um, trying to now measure the impact of regenerative wool. And man-made cellulosics, we work with a, uh, co not company, a nonprofit called Canopy, and to make sure that we educate our suppliers on what's what we don't want to source from you know ancient and endangered forests and in terms of linen there's actually a very limited organic linen supply so we're starting to think how can we also do what we did with the cotton supply chain by helping to source transitional linen um, and this is actually quite um the, the fact that we're a natural fiber company is actually quite unusual, I would say, because 51% of uh, fiber in the global fiber production is actually polyester. So like all the fleece that you guys love, those are from the oil rig, not from the farm. Um, and I want to kind of explain again the, you know, like silk comes from mulberry and silkworm. So it's like a, a joint effort. and we, let me see, we haven't really done very much on silk up until this point, to be honest. Out of the top five fibers, silk is the one we know the least about. Um, and it's 8%, as you can see, in our, in our um, fiber procurement. We have, the only thing that we've done on silk is on the chemistry side, the dyeing process. And we partner with a company, a Swiss company called Blue Sign. They focus on chemistry to reduce our toxicity level in, the, in that part of the supply chain. But in terms of human rights, we work with the suppliers, the sewing suppliers, but not so much at the, we don't even know, you know where the, the silk is really coming from. So after some conversations with the team when I was trying to decide what project to focus on, you know, at first I was like, oh, should I do leather? But leather is such a small percentage of our um, portfolio that I decided to just focus on silk and help to start the learning journey for the company. This is not my life's work, right? It's part of it. Um, so, so this is a, like the different components of my capstone project. Um, I did especially quite in-depth literature review on the political economy uh, of Chinese agriculture. Uh, because 80% of the world's silk comes from China, 16% comes from India. And what's its, what are the implications of the political economy side of things on uh, silk farmers' livelihood? I also did something uh, on the agroecosystems of mulberry on the environment and people. I don't know if Professor Drinkwater is here. She was really, really helpful uh, in guiding me on that. Uh, and I also decided to look into the welfare of mulberry silkworm because PETA actually has a campaign against silk. Um, you know, they said that it caused painful death for, for silkworm, uh, which I'll go into a little bit later. And the other components are just kind of, you know, there because they need to be there in order to understand the other parts of it. So there are just some numbers uh, here. I've already mentioned that 80% of the world's silk comes from China. And when we did a little survey into our supply chain map, it looks like 100% of our silk, Eileen uh, Fisher, is from China. And silk is less than 1% of the global fiber production. Um, polyester is 51, cotton is 24.5. But for us, it's 8% by weight. And when I say by weight, um, in terms of units of garment, it's actually more because silk, silk garment is lighter than a cotton garment. So uh, 
in terms of units, soap would be more than 8%. Um, and, you know, in 2018, we as a company source 139 metric tons of silk, uh, and the global silk production was estimated by textile exchange at 178,000 metric tons. So, supply chain transparency is really key to knowing our impact at the agricultural level. It's a long and winding supply chain, and when we, you know, we have, this is the information that we have, in June, before we started surveying the suppliers a little bit deeper. So in June, all we know is down to the yarn spinner level. We don't know what happened after that. Like in terms of reeling facility, uh, that's the, the process in which uh, the cocoon gets converted into raw silk yarn. I'm just going to pass this. You will see the silk worm is still inside. But that's considered dry cocoon. So. Um, so we decided to, to conduct a survey and trying to find out um, for a one full year, you know, we have three seasons a year, resort, spring, and fall, each of them is three months, and trying to see what we can, you know, gain more insight into. So we created a survey that's part of my paper um, to send it to our, the last known <laughs> contact that we have for the 100% uh, silk garment. We decided to only focus on those because when it comes to the blends, there's very little leverage that our suppliers have in asking their supplier, supplier, supplier to provide that information. So we decided to just focus in on the few um, suppliers, which are, it ended up being five of them that we sent to. <coughs> So first is the political economy side of China. Um, and, you know, China is a, is a country with unique challenges. And, you know, it has, uh, you know, the dichotomy between central government and local government. You know, people may not always follow the central government direction. Um, and in terms of property rights, um, you know, there's been a lot of evolution on the land tenure system in China, and that has an impact on how land is farmed and how farmers are organized or not. So it's been, you know, it's kind of moved from smallholder to contract farming to now potentially like corporate farming, where, you know, um, the recent land tenure changes has allowed corporations to lease large continuous pieces of land from multiple farmers in order to conduct larger scale um, silk farming. So there's also this trade war happening. Um, and you know, 80% of the world's silk is from China. So that's, that's something that I think our sourcing team is really watching. Um, it's really tricky because Silk is very tricky to sew, so it's not easy to make silk garment outside of China currently. Um, another thing that you know I also research a little bit about is the corruption risk. You know, in China, that could be a business reputation risk for us. Um, and economically, you know, there is depending on where silk is coming from, there is a, a potential of um, imbalanced power dynamics between the silk companies and the farmers because in the traditional sericultural region, silk is, you know, primarily developed on the east, eastern side of China and the Chinese government is trying to alleviate poverty on the western side. Though, so, th you know, since the 90s, they've been transferring the skill set to the west. And on the west side, because um, the silk industry is relatively young, there is much more of a transparent and open democratic type of relationship between the silk company and the government and the farmers. There's an open silk market, whereas on the eastern side, you know, like a lot of state silk companies used to be state-owned enterprises. So there's like really close relations between the silk companies and the government officials, and that has allowed them to influence land use plan, for example, um, to convert um, woodlands and forests or paddy land into 
cash crop land like for silk. So that has implications. Um, and China also has, has its environmental challenges. Um, and you know, we, uh, one thing that I, I read about in the, in the literature is that there is a more favorable view of environmental NGOs compared to human rights organizations. So if we ever decide to go there and work with a nonprofit on setting up something on responsible silk, then we should probably work closer with the um, environmental NGOs, even if it, even if it is, um, the focus is on the farmer's livelihood, we should try to work you know, with environmental NGOs. Um, so for the survey results that we received on the political economy side, you know, like I think that all of the information we received would have to be verified in person. <laughs> It's, it's, there's a lot of conflicting information that I received in the surveys, and I don't know that people truly understand the, the question to answer them properly because they don't get those questions very often, probably never been asked before. Um, so we would like to uh, start continuing the conversation. It's, the conversation has been started, and I'll be in China in November, so I will get to visit the mill and the spinner um, because harvest season ended you know, in November, so I won't be able to see a silk farm this year. But it would be good to, to obtain further information on what exactly are the terms in the contract for the silk farmers and how do you decide what to grow and who decides what to grow, you know, that kind of thing. So power dynamics is really something that we need to look into. The next thing is mulberry agroecosystems. You know, mulberry can be grown in a variety of ways. So this is the pure mulberry plantation. So that's where only mulberry is grown. Um, on the field, it's usually uh, on really um, flat land, um, which is an issue because it tends to replace uh, paddy rice and other, other types of food crops. Um, and mulberry is a tree, so it's a natural candidate for ag agroforestry systems. So uh, intercropping mulberry with other plants such as winter vegetables and grains and chrysanthemum in certain regions of China um, in, in, a, in a small mulberry farm that I visited in 2012, yeah, it was, they had chickens and ducks and rice as well as mulberry. Um, and there's also the traditional system which is really disappearing. Uh, it's the fish pond and mulberry dike system, so it's a bit of a circular system. The fish, um, species are being dredged and piled onto the dike uh, as fertilizer and the uh, silkworm eats the mulberry leaves and the species of the silkworm gets fed to the fish so it's a bit like a circle. There's also the scattered planting system on hillside. This is done in certain regions of China where there's uh, stony desertification. So this is um, usually done on not flat land, so like unproductive land, uh, otherwise that could generate some income from, for hillside communities. Uh, in our survey, it does appear that our silk is coming from uh, monoculture mulberry farm, which is not so good. Um, and this is the, like a table that summarizes the different environmental and social impacts of the different agroecosystems. Um, I think I want to, to highlight that mulberry, even though mulberry in natural ecosystems can be grown without any additional irrigation or, um, or fertilizing uh, in, in a silk production type system, it does require irrigation and it does require fertilization because inadequate nitrogen um, could lead to um, the leaves not having enough crude protein content and 
silk is a protein fiber, so that would affect the quality of the silk. Um, so, yeah, and like the main negative environmental impact for monoculture mulberry farm, I would say, is based on LCA data, is the fertilizer usage, is the highest environmental impact, and also the greenhouse gas emission from land use change. Um, compared to intercropping system, it also has lower biodiversity above and below ground. So it affects the soil microbial uh, community as well. But it does provide, you know, it's a lower labor requirement system compared to, say, the traditional system, um, as well as the intercropping system or the scattered planting system. But it, it has good and bad. And of course, I, I think that at the end of the day, the system itself is not su sufficient in determining whether or not it is good or bad. From a sustainability point of view, it's really um, what, you know, for intercropping, it can be bad if you grow mulberry with corn because they both require really a lot of nitrogen. Then you end up just putting on more nitrogen and fertilizer onto the land. So, but all four of these generate economic benefits for the farmers. That's, that's what we're realizing too, is it does, uh, silk is a high, high, um, high price commodity. Um, so it does, it's lucrative, you know, when, when they're doing it just a few months a year. Now this, um, my environmental counterpart did a, a carbon footprint based on 2017 data. And, you know, I want to say that you see that silk here, it says 14% fiber use. That's based on units. You know, in 2018, we switched to weight. But when, when I asked my counterpart what this 14% meant in weight, it's actually also 8%. So the same, same numbers, we have been using the same amount of silk you know, ratio-wise, um, 2017 and 18. And from a carbon uh, perspective, silk has the highest GHG emission out of our top 10 fiber. Um, you can see cotton is, uh, organic cotton is seven, silk is 45. So silk and wool are really the two most um, carbon intensive fiber that we have. And, you know, for wool, we started sourcing responsible wool and, re, you know, with regenerative agriculture. So hopefully that will help reduce the impact. Um, but for silk, really, it's something that we, we want to do something with. And this is um, to give you an idea of putting together the two charts side by side, fiber use versus impact, you'll see that Silk is 14.4% in terms of units and fiber use, but it represents 24.4% of the <laughs> greenhouse gas emission. And so how can we reduce the greenhouse gas impact of silk? Um, and a lot of that, like I said, comes from fertilizer and the farm. So we do want to start addressing that. So I mentioned at the beginning, you know, PETA has a campaign against silk because I don't know. Uh, so silk, silkworm eats uh, mulberry leaves and then, you know, their life cycle is about 45 days. And during that 45 days, they change from a tiny silkworm to a cocoon, which I was passing around. Ah, yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and then we kill them at the end before they turn into a moth because we don't want them to chew a hole and that would break the long one continuous strand of filament silk, um, which decreases its, its real ability and the strength of the fiber. You know, silk is one of the strongest fiber actually. Uh, so we are just selfish human beings killing silkworms. Um, so, silkworm is actually a heavily domesticated being for like thousands of years. It's been completely exploited by human beings. It's lost its ability to fly, you know, it's been 
selectively bred for like the ones that produce the bigger cocoons, the ones that lay the most eggs, the ones that um, have higher quality silk filament. So they can't fly. After they chew themselves out of the, if they were to chew themselves out of the cocoon, they cannot fly, they cannot eat. So they rely on the energy they consume during the worm stage to survive for a week. Um, so, but they do have a brain and a nervous system uh, based on literature and they do experience nociception. It is unclear whether or not they experience emotions such as fear or they can translate the, the nociception into pain, but they do die in the production of silk. Um, so right now we have an animal welfare statement on our website and it does not cover silk. Uh, so I think the next step for us is to decide what is our stance when it comes to the welfare of silkworm. And, you know, there are alternatives to silk, but there are other downsides too. Polyester, for example, does have other environmental implications and social implications. And it creates microplastic that could harm other animals. Uh, so... I think whatever we end up doing, animal welfare will have to be considered at a more macro and holistic level and not just looking at silk. And if PETA really does care about all animals, you know, I think they should do that too. But um, it's difficult, uh, challenging to try to balance everything. So I... Um, the, the, the conclusion of my capstone is to try to come up with a plan for how to get to responsible silk. And I learned a lot this past year, but I feel like I'm just barely scratching the surface and there's still a long way to go. Um, and this is like from experience from other colleagues. Um, we often start something and it takes maybe three to five years later before you even hear about it <laughs> on the website. Uh, so we've, I've been sharing what I learned internally, you know, after the winter semester last year, and then this time I shared the whole thing. Um, and people are very excited. Now we know a little bit more about what to ask suppliers. Like there was a supplier who claimed that he, he can give us regenerative silk and then our you know, supply chain transparency person now knows what, what question to ask. Oh, what are you growing the mulberry with? Oh, where is it? And so like just a little bit more uh, context to base our um, questions on. But still, how do we evaluate the answers that we're getting? That's still a, still a challenge. Um, so the next steps are that you know, I really want to talk to textile exchange I'm going to the conference next month um, because silk has not been a major focus because it's less than 1% of the fiber production. <laughs> want to talk to regenerative organic certification um, to see if, because I, the, based on my contacts with the industry, um, another friend, uh, she said that I don't think they've considered silk yet, you know, for regenerative. And also, um, Really, I think the best way to learn is to be in the field and talk to the, to the farmers. So I'm hoping to get there next harvest season in you know, May and visiting stakeholders and maybe visiting the very few good organic farms, organic silk farms. There's only one in China. Uh, I mean, one group in China. So um, maybe go there for some inspiration, maybe take some of our suppliers along to go see it. Um, so, and then hopefully we can research, strategize, and implement a plan between 2020 and 2024, and in 2025 start to have some results, you know, in five years. Um, <laughs> so we, based on calculation though, um, you know, it, it's interesting because on the survey, it shows that we are indirectly sourcing from 59,200 farmers. That's a lot of farmers. And um, but using the calculation of how much silk farmers can produce in terms of dry cocoons, we only need 1,000 silk farmers. 
So I think you know, our hope is to get to a stage where we can nominate a silk supply chain um, and ask our suppliers to source from that farm and only that farm. I mean, we say nominate, we really are, say, requiring. Um, that's kind of what we do <laughs> with the cotton and the, and the wool. And if we can do that, you know, 1,000 farmers could provide us with enough silk fiber for an entire year. And of course, there are some risk there because we did that with the cotton. And then there was some, some, you know, crop failure could happen. And then we were scrambling to find additional cotton somewhere else. Um, so you do have to try to balance things. So remaining questions. Right now, it appears that our silk is coming from monoculture mulberry plantations. So is there a way to grow silk that can create positive environmental impact you know, through regenerative and organic agriculture? Or could mulberry only be less bad? Um, and yeah, so like how can we minimize and can it be restorative? So that's a question that, that we have right now that we don't have an answer to that requires further research. Um, and also in the process of setting something up like this, um, how could we and the supplier you know, practically encourage this kind of, like a, a beneficial arrangement for the silk farmer so that they're not just being told what to do, so that they have a voice, um, in right now, farmers cooperatives don't seem to exist. Um, true farmer cooperatives in China. So, you know, if we try to do that, will we be considered a threat by the Chinese government? Um, how do we how do we um, go about doing that? Uh, that's like another big question. And based on what we're reading on the regenerative organic certified framework. Um, it doesn't look like the, if we, e even if we were to able to figure out a way to grow mulberry in a regenerative organic way, it does not, it has an animal welfare component that I don't think we can meet because silkworms do die um, in the production of silk. So <coughs> that's a conversation that we need to have with regenerative organic certified. And yeah, actually, if anyone's interested in researching this, I'm happy to chat offline. Um, and um, this is like the end. Um, I want to share this one video because I think, um, wait, oh, here. Oh, how do I, whoops. When I first started farming, and I was farming conventional, you'd be on the field fixing your spray rig, either for herbicides or insecticides. Inevitably, a nozzle would fall off. you get drenched with whatever chemical you were using. My son, Dossie, when he was born, I thought to myself, boy, this is no place to raise a child. Norma and I decided that maybe this is time to go organic. Everybody wants that piece of paper that says organic, but getting there is three years of no chemical inputs. And during that time, it basically you lose money. Eileen Fisher came along and helped us so much to transition another nice piece of land. We feel like we're growing for Eileen. It's her cotton and we try to do the best job we can. There's a lot of satisfaction knowing where your cotton's going.
The mulberry fields were behind the silk railing facility, so silk railing requires a lot of water. Those of you that felt the cocoons could feel how hard they were, that's because silk is fibroid and sericin. To remove that gum from the sericin requires a lot of hot water. So the facility was actually using that wastewater from reeling to water to provide irrigation for the mulberry fields behind the facility. And then the pupa, which is chilled in the process, was then dried on the roof of the building and then sold as fish food. So there was this like entire process. I realized that in India, a lot of that silk production is domestic, for domestic use, it's not exported, so there may not be the cut and soak facilities that you would need there. But are you at all interested in exploring other regions of the world where silk is produced and there may be greater potential for transitional um, opportunities? Yeah, I think we're, we're open to, to a lot of things. I think that I haven't actually had that conversation with our fabric R&D team. Um, so it would be good to find out, you know, it's interesting because when I go visit our suppliers in India, they always source silk from China. And I think that part of that might have something to do with quality, but I don't know. So that's a, you know, happy to chat um, and then passing that information to the other teams to explore. We do have a silk uh, sewing uh, supplier in, in India that we work with, but they source from China. So, um, yeah. Uh, what sort of alternatives have you ad campaign you did consider in regards to the animal welfare side. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it as a concern. What sort of alternatives are there to the current? Um, well, you could use polyester, which has a silk-like quality, um, if it's like processed a certain way. There is ahimsa silk, which uh, I don't know if you guys know. So like that's when the, the moth does make it out of the cocoon and the quality of the silk is different um, because it's rougher. Uh, they, call, they call it raw silk in some, some instances. So in those sense, the moth does live. They, they do live. Um, but the supply is very, very limited. Um, that's an issue. And there is man-made silk. So there's now um, biotech companies that are trying to create, artificially create spider silk from yeast and sugar and water so uh, but that is also not has not reached commercial scale yet and for us you know it's GMO corn the, the sugar comes from GMO corn so that's that's something that we we would prefer not to support but um, there's also man-made cellulosics um, from wood so um, like cupro uh, rayon certain types of rayon uh, maybe tensile. So there, there are other alternatives, but they won't function exactly like silk. Um, um, earlier you had mentioned uh, that there was an organic silk farm in China. There was only one, but then later on you mentioned um, would silk ever become regenerative organic certified? So what's the difference there, and what makes the uh, one organic silk farm in China? I think that that's something that I don't have as much information on yet. Um, I'm able to find some information on the website. I think for organic agriculture, you know, other people can probably speak much better to it than I do, but it's, it has a crop rotation component, so it won't be just mulberry. Um, and also how they put manure. Um, yeah, I, I, that's something that I, I would... I, not my not my area of expertise i don't feel like very comfortable explaining but i do know the the bi the the organic farm that i read about uh in in the literature they they have some biodynamic component where they have trees around the farm that encourage uh indigenous birds um so that's as much information that I have right now on that farm, and we would really like to visit that. And regenerative, I think, is different from organic in the sense that it's um, trying to restore the earth. Like, they focus a lot on soil um, restoration and uh, focusing on the, the water cycle 
and as well as the carbon cycle and also the biodiversity component um, in the soil and above the soil. So I don't know if anyone wants to add anything and help me out. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I know enough yet to colonize anyone, <laughs> but, but, you know, I think my, my hope to go there is to actually figure out what, what people care about, you know, um, and then trying to ask them if they know someone who's doing something different, and then hopefully to be able to connect with the other people. You know, I'm thinking perhaps Silk Institute in the, maybe the local extension, you know, agents for silk, they call it sericultural guidance stations. So maybe visiting those people and they are often connected to a university. So kind of like a Cornell to a, to a farm. So, so I'm going to try to, to explore that, you know, in, in the places I go. And, and then hopefully when I go back in May, I can actually visit some of those people and talk to them in the meantime. But yeah, no, I, 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 I totally, you know, we as a company don't feel like we know enough um, yet to, to educate. And I think it's very often a two-way street. And in terms of the questions that we have on the survey, you know, it, it's really hard to tell whether they're giving us an answer just to make us happy, you know, because there is an imbalanced power dynamic between us and the supplier as well. So just like the farmer and the, and the silk company, we also have a, you know, they'll do everything we ask them to do. But in terms of quality, you know, I know that it, things don't look right, but how wrong is it? I don't know. So that's the challenge. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is one of the ones. And I, I mean, I don't know the details about that, you know, that haven't had a conversation with the sourcing team, but I did read in Women's Wear Daily that certain products, if they're under 70% silk, then they're excluded from the tariffs. But, you know, the president is changing things, you know, very drastically, quickly, you know, so we don't really know. They are watching. But silk, regardless of um, where we end up sewing it, you know, if we are able to sew it outside of China, the raw material will, will always very likely come from China just because they 80% of it is from China. So if we source the finished garment that's not sewn in China, I don't think we are affected by the tariffs. But unless there is some tariff situation between the sewing location and China itself, then, then yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Luna.